November 5th, 1902, Volume 4, The Tree of Life Rooted in the Heart of Jesus. This morning my adorable Jesus made himself seen in my interior, and he seemed to have a tree planted in his heart, and so rooted into it that its roots arose from the center of his heart. In sum, it seemed to be born together with it, with the same nature. I was amazed at seeing its beauty, strikingness, and height, which seemed to touch the heavens, and its branches extended out to the farthest ends of the world. Now on seeing me so amazed, blessed Jesus told me, My daughter, this tree was conceived together with me in the center of my heart, and from that moment I felt in my inmost heart all the good and all the evil that man would do with this tree of redemption, called Tree of Life. In fact, all those souls who remain united to this tree will receive the life of grace in time, and when the tree has raised them well, it will administer to them the life of glory in eternity. Yet what is not my sorrow? Even though they cannot root out the tree, nor can they touch the trunk, Many try to cut some branches so that souls may not receive life, and to take away from me all the glory and the pleasure that this tree of life would have produced for me. While saying this, he disappeared. The will of God crystallizes the soul, the knowledge of the palace of the divine will. As I was in my usual state, my always lovable Jesus made himself seen holding many little lambs in his arms, some leaning on his breast, some on his shoulders, some clinging to his neck, some on the right, some on the left, in his arms, and some peeking out with their little heads from within his heart. However, the feet of all these little lambs were all in the heart of our Lord, and his breath was the nourishment he gave to them. They were all turned with their mouths toward the mouth of my sweet Jesus to receive the nourishment of his breath. It was really beautiful to see how Jesus took highest pleasure, all intent in nourishing them and delighting with them. They really seemed as many births delivered by his most holy heart. Then turning to me, he said, My daughter, these little lambs that you see in my arms are the children of my will, legitimate births from my supreme volition. They will come out from within my heart, but will keep their feet in the center of my heart, so that they may take nothing from the earth, and may be concerned with nothing but me alone. Look at them, how beautiful they are, how clean and nourished they grow, fed by my breath alone. They will be the glory, the crown of creation. Then he added, My will crystallizes the soul, and just as when any object is placed close to a crystal, another object is formed within it, fully similar to the one which is placed in front of it. So does my will reflect all it does in these souls, crystallized by my power. And they repeat and do all that my supreme will does. And just as my will is everywhere, in heaven, on earth, and in every place, so do these souls, wherever my will is acting, absorb it like crystal within them, and repeat my act, because they contain my will in them as their own life. Therefore, as I act, I take great delight in placing myself in front of them to see my own action being repeated in them. They are my mirrors and my will multiplies them everywhere, for every act it does. So there is not one created thing in which they are not present, in the creatures, in the sea, in the sun, in the stars, and even in heaven. And my will receives the return of my act from the creature in a divine manner. This is also the reason why I love so much that the living in my will be known, to multiply more of these mirrors crystallized by my will, 
to have my works repeated in them. Then I will not be alone any more, but I will have the creature in my company. I will have her with me, intimately with me, in the depth of my will, almost inseparable from me, as if she had just come out of my womb when I created her, having followed no other way contrary to my will. How happy I will be! On hearing this, I said to him, My love and my life I still cannot convince myself. How is it possible that no saint has always done your most holy will, and has lived in the way you are now saying, in your will? And Jesus, Ah, my daughter, you still do not want to convince yourself that one can take as much light, grace, variety, and value for as much as he knows? Surely there have been saints who have always done my will, but they took of my will as much as they knew. They knew that doing my will was the greatest act, that which honored me the most, and which brought sanctification. And with this intention they did it, and this is what they took, because there is no sanctity without my will, and no good nor sanctity, little or small, can come without it. You must know that what my will was, it is, and will be, it has changed in nothing. But as it manifests itself, it makes known the variety of the colors, effects, and values it contains. And it does not just make itself known, but it gives to the soul the variety of its colors, effects, and values. Otherwise, why make them known? My will acted like a great lord who showed his most extensive and sumptuous palace. To the first ones he pointed out the way in order to reach his palace. To the second, the door. To the third, the stairs. To the fourth, the first rooms. And to the last ones he opened all the rooms, making them the owners and giving them all the goods which are in it. Now the first ones have taken the goods which are on the way, the second the goods which are at the door, superior to those which are on the way, the third those of the stairs, the fourth those of the first rooms, where there are more goods and are kept more safely, the last ones the goods of the whole palace. So has my will done. It had to make known the way, the door, the stairs, the first rooms, to be able to move on into the whole immensity of my will, and to show them the great goods which are in it, and how the creature operating in these goods contained in my will acquires the variety of its colors, of its immensity, sanctity, and power, and of all my works. In making something known, I give and impress in the soul that divine quality which I make known. If you knew under what mighty waves of graces you are, when I move on to make you know other effects of my will, and how I paint in your soul, as a skillful painter, the different effects and values which I make you know with the most vivid colors, you would remain crushed beneath my waves. But having compassion for your weakness, I sustain you. And while I sustain you, I impress more within you what I tell you. Because if I speak, I act. Therefore, be attentive and faithful. November 5th, 1923, Volume 16 In one who lives in the divine will, Jesus does not form the mystical life given to those who live in his grace but without having their acts identified in the divine volition. Rather, he forms his real life, like in the most holy sacrament, and still more. I felt oppressed because of the privation of my sweet Jesus, with the addition that my confessor, because I didn't have the trust to open up with him, and because I was bad, had denied me the absolution. So, having received Holy Communion 
I abandoned myself in the arms of my most sweet Jesus, telling him, My love, help me, do not abandon me. You know in what state I find myself because of your privation. And still, instead of help, creatures add pains to pains. Without you, I have no one else with whom to cry for my hard destiny of having lost you. This should push you more not to leave me alone, to keep at least company to a poor abandoned one who lives dying in her hard exile. Therefore you, who are the highest priest, give me the absolution. Tell me that you forgive the sins that are in my soul. Let me hear your most sweet voice which gives me life and forgiveness. Now, while I was pouring out my pain with Jesus, he made himself seen in my interior. The sacramental veils formed like a mirror in which Jesus was, alive and real. And my sweet Jesus told me, My daughter, this mirror is the accident of bread, which keeps me imprisoned within them. I form my life in the host, but it does not give me anything not one affection, not a heartbeat, not the tiniest I love you. It is as if dead for me. I remain alone, without the shadow of anything in return. Therefore my love is almost impatient to get out, to break this glass, descending into hearts, in order to find in them that return which the host doesn't know how to give me nor can it do so. But do you know where I find my true return? In the soul who lives in my will. As soon as I descend into her heart, I consume the accidents of the host, because I know that more noble accidents, more dear to me, are ready to imprison me in order to keep me inside that heart, which will not only give me life in itself, but life for life. I will no longer be alone, but with my most faithful company. We will be two hearts palpitating together. We will love united. Our desires will be one. So I remain in her, and I live my life there, alive and real, just as I do in the Most Holy Sacrament. But do you know what these accidents are which I find in the soul who does my will? These are her acts done in my volition, which, more than accidents, extend themselves around me. They imprison me, but inside a noble divine person, not a dark one, because her acts done in my will illuminate and warm more than sun. Oh, how happy I feel to live my real life in her. I feel as if I were inside my celestial royal palace. Look at me in your heart. How happy I am. How I delight and feel the purest joys. And I, my beloved Jesus, isn't this a new and special thing that you are telling me? That you live your real life in one who lives in your will? Isn't this rather the mystical life? Which you live in the hearts that possess your grace? And Jesus, no, no, it is not a mystical life, as it is for those who possess my grace, but who do not live with their acts identified in my volition, and therefore do not have sufficient material to form the accidents and imprison me. It would be as if the priest lacked the host, and still wanted to pronounce the words of the consecration. He could pronounce them, but he would say them to the empty space. My sacramental life would certainly not have existence. In the same way, I find myself in the hearts which might possess my grace, but do not live completely in my will. I am in them by grace, but not in reality. And I, my love, but how is it possible that you can really live in the soul who lives in your will? And Jesus, my daughter, don't I perhaps live in the sacramental host, alive and real, in body, blood, soul, and divinity? And why do I live in the host, 
in body, blood, soul, and divinity, because there is not a will which is opposed to mine. If I found in the host a will opposed to mine, I would not form either a real or a perennial life in it. This is also the reason for which the sacramental accidents are consumed when creatures receive me. I do not find a human will united with mine, disposed to give itself in order to acquire my will. Rather, I find a will which wants to act and do by itself. So I make my little visit, and I leave. On the other hand, for one who lives in my will, my volition and hers are one. And if I do this in the host, how much more can I do it in her? More so, since I find a heartbeat, an affection, my reward and interest, all that I do not find in the host. My real life is necessary to the soul who lives in my will. Otherwise, how could she live in my volition? Ah, you don't want to understand that the sanctity of living in my will is a sanctity completely different from the other sanctities. Except for the crosses, the mortifications, the necessary acts of life which, done in my will, embellish her even more. It is nothing other than the life of the blessed in heaven, who, living in my will, by virtue of it, possess me within each one of them, as if I were only for each one, alive and real, and not mystically, but really dwelling within them. And just as this could not be called life of heaven if they did not have me within them as their own life, and their happiness would not be perfect and complete if even a tiny particle of my life were missing in them, in the same way, my will would be neither full nor perfect in one who lives in my volition if my real life, which this will emits, were missing. It is true that these are all prodigies of my love. In fact, this is the prodigy of prodigies which my will has kept within itself until now, and which it now wants to deliver in order to achieve the primary purpose of the creation of man. Therefore, I want to form my first real life within you. In hearing this, I said, Ah, oh, my love, Jesus! Yet I feel so bad for all these contrasts, and you know it. It is true that this serves me to abandon myself more into your arms, and to ask from you what they do not give me. But with all this I feel a breath of disturbance that troubles the peace of my soul. And you are telling me that you want to form your real life in me? Oh, how far I am from this. And Jesus again, Daughter, don't worry about this. All that I want is that you add nothing of your own, and that you obey as much as you can. It is known that all other sanctities, that is, those of obedience and of other virtues, are not exempt from pettiness, disturbance, arguments, and wastes of time, which prevent the forming of a beautiful sun. At the most, they form a little star. Only the sanctity of my will is exempt from these miseries. Furthermore, my will encloses all the sacraments and their effects. Therefore, abandon yourself completely in my will. Make it yours, and you will receive the effects of the absolution, or of anything else which you might be denied. So I recommend that you not waste any time, since by wasting time you hamper my real life, which I am forming in you. November 5th, 1925, Volume 18, The Moans of the Holy Spirit in the Sacraments, The Requital of Love of the Soul. I was fusing myself in the holy divine volition according to my usual way, and while I was trying, as much as I could, to requite my Jesus with my little love for all that he has done in redemption, my lovable and sweet love, Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, 
with your flight and my will, reach all the sacraments instituted by me, descend into the depths of them, to give me your little requital of love. Oh, how many of my secret tears you will find, how many bitter sighs, how many suffocated moans of the Holy Spirit. His moaning is continuous before the many disillusions of our love. The sacraments were instituted in order to continue my life on earth in the midst of my children. But alas, how many sorrows. This is why I feel the necessity of your little love. It may be small, but my will will make it great. My love does not tolerate for one who must live in my will not to associate herself with my sorrows, and not to give me her little requital of love for all that I have done and that I suffer. Therefore, my daughter, see how my love moans in the sacraments. If I see a newborn being baptized, I cry with sorrow, because while through baptism I restore his innocence, I find my child again. I give back to him the rights over creation which he had lost. I smile at him with love and satisfaction. I make the enemy flee from him, that he may no longer have any right over him. I entrust him to the angels, and all of heaven makes feast for him. Soon my smile turns into sorrow, the feast into mourning. I see that the one who is baptized will be an enemy of mine a new Adam, and maybe even a lost soul. Oh, how my love moans in each baptism, especially then if one adds that the minister who is baptizing does not do it with that respect, dignity, and decorum, which befit a sacrament that contains the new regeneration. Ah, many times they pay more attention to a bagatelle, to whatever show, than to administering a sacrament. So my love feels itself being pricked by the baptizer and by the one who is baptized, and it moans with unutterable moans. Would you not want then to give me a requital of love, a loving moan for each baptism, so as to keep company with my sorrowful moans? Move on to the sacrament of confirmation. Ah, how many bitter sighs! While through confirmation I restore his courage, I give back to him the lost strengths, rendering him invincible to all enemies and to his passions, and he is admitted to the ranks of the militia of his creator, that he may fight for the acquisition of the celestial fatherland, and the Holy Spirit gives him his loving kiss again, lavishes a thousand caresses on him, and offers himself as the companion of his career, yet Many times he feels himself being requited with the kiss of a traitor, his caresses being despised, his company shunned. How many moans, how many sighs for his return, how many secret voices to the heart for the one who shuns him, to the point of tiring himself from speaking. But no, it is in vain. Therefore, do you not want to give your requital of love, your loving kiss, your company to the Holy Spirit, who moans because of so much neglection? But do not stop. Keep flying, and you will hear the anguishing moans of the Holy Spirit in the sacrament of penance. How much ingratitude, how many abuses and profanations on the part of those who administer it and on the part of those who receive it. In this sacrament, my blood places itself in act over the contrite sinner in order to descend upon his soul, to wash him, embellish him, heal him, and strengthen him, to give back to him the lost grace, to place in his hands the keys of heaven which sin had snatched away from him, to impress on his forehead the peacemaking kiss of forgiveness. But oh, how many harrowing moans, 
in seeing souls approaching this sacrament of penance without sorrow, out of habit, almost as a vent of the human heart. Others, horrible to be said, instead of going to find the life of their souls, of grace, go to find death, to pour out their passions. So the sacrament is reduced to a mockery, to a nice chat, and my blood, instead of descending as a bath, descends as fire, which withers them even more. And so, in each confession, our love cries inconsolably and sobbing, repeats, Human in gratitude, how great you are, everywhere you try to offend me, and while I offer you life, you turn the very life I offer you into death. See, then, how our moans await your requital of love in the sacrament of penance. Do not let your love stop. Go through all the tabernacles, through each sacramental host, and in each host you will hear the Holy Spirit moan with unutterable sorrow. The sacrament of the Eucharist is not only their own life that souls receive, but it is my very life that gives itself to them. So the fruit of this sacrament is to form my life in them, and each communion serves to make my life grow, to develop it, in such a way that one may be able to say, I am another Christ. But alas, how few take advantage of it. Even more how many times I descend into hearts and they make me find the weapons to wound me and repeat for me the tragedy of my passion. And as the sacramental species are consumed, instead of pressing me to stay with them, I am forced to leave bathed with tears, crying over my sacramental lot. And I find no one who calms my crying and my sorrowful moans. If you could break those veils of the host which cover me, you would find me bathed with crying, knowing the lot that awaits me in descending into hearts. Therefore, let your requital of love for each host be continuous, in order to calm my crying, and to render less sorrowful the moans of the Holy Spirit. Do not stop. Otherwise, we will not find you always together with us in our moans and in our secret tears. We will feel the void of your requital of love. Descend into the sacrament of ordination. Yes, here you will find our most intimate, hidden sorrows. The most bitter tears. The most harrowing moans. The ordination constitutes man to a supreme height, to a divine character, the repeater of my life, the administer of the sacraments, the revealer of my secrets, of my gospel, of the most sacred science, the peacemaker between heaven and earth, the bearer of Jesus to souls, but alas, how many times we see in the ordained one how he will be a Judas for us, a usurper of the character which is being impressed in him. Oh, how the Holy Spirit moans in seeing in the ordained one the most sacred things, the greatest character which exists between heaven and earth being snatched away from him. How many profanations! Each act of this ordained one, not done according to the character impressed, will be a cry of sorrow, a bitter crying, a harrowing moan. The ordination is the sacrament which encloses all other sacraments together. Therefore, if the ordained one is able to preserve whole within himself the character he has received, he will almost place all other sacraments in safety. He will be the defender and the savior of Jesus himself. But not seeing this in the ordained one, 
Our sorrows are sharpened more. Our moans become more continuous and sorrowful. Therefore let your requital of love flow in each priestly act to keep company with the moaning love of the Holy Spirit. Lend us the ear of your heart and listen to our profound moans in the sacrament of marriage. How many disorders in it! Marriage was elevated by me to a sacrament in order to place it in a sacred bond, the symbol of the sacrosanct trinity, the divine love which it encloses. So the love which was to reign in the father, mother, and children, the concord, the peace, was to symbolize the celestial family. I was to have on earth as many other families similar to the family of the Creator, destined to populate the earth like as many terrestrial angels, to then bring them back to populate the celestial regions. But oh, how many moans and seeing families of sin being formed in the marriage, which symbolize hell, with discord, with lack of love, with hatred, and which populate the earth like many rebellious angels who will serve to populate hell. The Holy Spirit moans with harrowing moans in each marriage in seeing so many infernal dens being formed on earth. Therefore place your requital of love in each marriage, in each creature which comes to the light. In this way your loving moan will render less sorrowful our continuous moans. Our moans are not yet finished, therefore let your requital of love reach the bed of the dying one when the sacrament of the extreme unction is administered. But ah, how many moans, how many of our secret tears! This sacrament has the virtue of placing the dying sinner in safety at any cost. It is the confirmation of sanctity for the good and the holy. It is the last bond which it establishes through its unction between the creature and God. It is the seal of heaven which it impresses in the redeemed soul. It is the infusion of the merits of the Redeemer in order to enrich her, purify her, and embellish her. It is the final brushstroke which the Holy Spirit gives her in order to dispose her to depart from the earth so as to make her appear before her Creator. In sum, the extreme unction is the final display of our love and the final clothing of the soul. It is the rearranging of all the good works. Therefore, it acts in a surprising way in those who are alive to grace. With the extreme unction, the soul is as though covered by a celestial dew, which extinguishes as though in one breath her passions, her attachment to the earth, and to all that does not belong to heaven. But alas, how many moans, how many bitter tears, how many indispositions, how many negligences, how many losses of souls, how few the sanctities it finds to be confirmed, how scarce the good works to be reordered and rearranged. Oh, if all could hear our moans, our crying over the bed of the dying one in the act of administering the sacrament of the extreme unction, all would cry with sorrow. Do you not want, then, to give us your requital of love for each time this sacrament is administered, which is the final display of our love toward the creature? Our will awaits you everywhere to have your requital of love and your company with our moans and sighs. November 5th, 1934, Volume 33 True love forms in the creature the little place in the divine works, 
in order to be able to enclose the life of the divine will. I feel an irresistible strength that never lets me stop, and it seems that every created thing, everything that my sweet Jesus has done, has done and suffered, says to me, For you I have created it, for your love, and you do not want to place anything for my love, anything of yours in what I have done for you? I have cried for you, I have suffered, I have died for you. And you do not want to place anything of yours in my tears, in my sufferings, in my death. My whole being searches for you, and you do not want to invest and search for all my things in order to invest them and enclose them in your I love you. I am all love, and you do not want to be all love for me. I remained confused, and my poor mind took the course of the acts done in the divine will in order to be able to say, Even I have placed my acts in yours, even though it would be a little I love you of mine, but in my I love you I place all of myself. But while I made my course, my sweet Jesus surprising me with his brief little visit, all goodness, told me, my blessed daughter, you must know that true love in the creature places me in the conditions of making me forget everything, and of disposing me to concede that my will come to reign on earth. Not that I suffer from forgetfulness. That cannot be in me. It would be a defect. But rather, I experience such enjoyment in the true love of the creature when I find that all the particles of her being tell me that they love me. And this love of hers for me, overflowing outside, invests me and runs in my whole being, in my works, and as kneading itself with me makes me feel her love anywhere and everywhere. In order to enjoy this love of the creature, I set everything aside, and as if I were forgetting about it, she inclines me so much that she deposes me and imposes herself over me to give her surprising things and what she wants, and even the kingdom of my will. True love has such power that it calls my will as life in the human being. You must know that when I extended the heavens, I created the sun, even from then, in my all-seeingness, I saw your love run in the sky, investing the light of the sun, and in all created things you formed a little place in order to love me. And oh, how I rejoiced, and even from then my will ran toward you and those who would love me, in order to give itself as life in that little place of love. See, therefore, my will goes through the centuries. It reduces them to one single point, all in act, and finds the place of love for where to put its life, in order to continue it with all its majesty and divine decorum. I came on earth, but do you know in whom I found the little place in order to enclose my life? In the true love of the creature. Even from then I already saw your love that, crowning me, invested all my humanity and flowed in my blood, in all my particles as kneading itself with me. Everything was in act for me and as present, and my tears found the little place for where to pour themselves out. My love, my sufferings, my life found the refuge for where to be able to be in a secure place, and my death found even the resurrection in the true love of the creature and my divine will found its kingdom for where to reign. Therefore, if you want that my divine will come to reign as life in creatures, let me find your love everywhere, anywhere, and in everything. Let me feel it always. With this you will form the stake for where to burn everything that, consuming everything that is not of my will, 
will form the place for where to be able to enclose my will. And then all my works will find their place, their hiding spot, for where to be able to continue the good and the operating virtue that they possess. And in this way, we both will make an exchange of place. You will find your little place in me and in all my works, and I will find it in you and in all your acts. Therefore, always forward in my divine will, in order to form the stake of love, for where you will burn yourself and all the impediments that impede its reigning in the midst of creatures. End of November 5th Fiat.